The Innovation Show is brought to you by Gate One and Gate One Incubator that supports its team to become founder investors in a growing portfolio of startup opportunities. You can find Gate One at gateoneconsulting.com. Today's book offers more than 80 assignments, countless ideas, and memorable stories collected throughout the Stanford D School's decade plus history. Our guest painstakingly curated this collection from some of the world's most inventive minds, including D School and IDEO founder David Kelly, amongst many others. She is with us today to share some of those assignments to spark our creativity because a common characteristic of our audience is, without a doubt, curiosity. It is a pleasure to welcome Executive Director of the Stanford D School and the author of Creative Acts for Curious People, How to Think, Create and Lead in Unconventional Ways, Sarah Stein Greenberg. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Aidan. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. It's been a few years since we talked about the disco. We had on the show before Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, and we talked about the book at the time, Design Your Life, one of the suite of books from the D-School. But I'd love you to share a little bit about the D-School because our show has grown exponentially since then, and we have many new audience members, and perhaps they'd love to know a little bit more about Stanford's D-School. That's a great place to start. Uh, The D-School's mission is to help people unlock their creative abilities and apply them to the world and really to the kinds of challenges that they see fit. So that could be challenges at work, that could be launching new products or services, that could be challenges in your community or in your home life even. Um, Design is this really flexible, adaptable set of skills and methods and strategies for looking at challenges through fresh eyes and getting new ideas and really applying, you know, some unconventional ways of thinking to make things better and improve things both for yourself and for other people. It's such a valuable experience for people. I was thinking about D school. I was thinking about me in school, graduating from high school, from secondary school here in Ireland, and how I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. And what you do in those times is, if you're privileged enough to be able to afford education, you do what you were kind of good at, or you least sucked at. And you do also, oftentimes what you expect other people want you to do, oftentimes parents, or friends, etc. And you're not really living your own life. And that's what I love about the idea of D school and designing your own life. I think that's right. And actually, David, who you mentioned um, in the intro, uh, who's the founder of the D school, he likes to say there's kind of two sets of students that we often come across, right? There's those who are, um, you know, really sure from the get go exactly what they want to major in, but actually, maybe it's like what their parents want them to major in. And then there's students who are genuinely, you know, open and unsure, but then they kind of don't quite find something that gives them clarity. And so they end up declaring whatever major they have kind of the most classes towards when it comes, you know, time to, to make that declaration. And I think, you know, we really have this philosophy around um, helping people explore what's meaningful to them. And part of what's often missing for folks is that sense of what we call creative confidence, right? The ability to look at a set of challenges and know that you have something to offer, that you have a way to dive in, even if you're not really familiar with that problem space or that opportunity space before. So having a little exposure and a little experience to design can often be a really orienting experience for folks. There's so much in the book. I mentioned there's 80 assignments in the book. But there's also 16 different sections. And I'd love to cover them all. But your publisher would kill me and you'd kill me because we take up so much time. But you really could do an episode on each of the sections. And I'm going to mention the sections because it's really interesting. It gives an overview of what the book is achieving. So the sections go as follows seeing things in new ways, working well with others, make sense of your insights, come up with new ideas, build something, tell a compelling story, put your work out there, take control of your own learning, locate your own voice, 
get out and discover, pick up the pace, slow down and focus, have fun, work toward equity, peer into the future and tackle a whole project. But I thought we'd start with an exercise from work towards equity. And this is a great exercise for many reasons. Some because we will learn to take the perspective of other people. And that's so important when you're designing a product or a service. But it is so important when it comes to innovation and people who work in innovation, because we tend to see things the way we see it. And by seeing it through the eyes of the other person, particularly somebody we're trying to sell a new idea to, we can position and frame it very well. And the exercise that you recommend to help us with this discipline is one you call handle with care. Yeah, that's a that's a great lead in. Um, so first, let me just say that all of the assignments in this book are drawn from across our just utterly brilliant teaching community. So interviewed faculty and designers who've been teaching at the D school for a long time and really handpicked these this set because I think these are going to resonate with people, whatever kind of work that they do. Um, this particular assignment um, came from a teaching team that was interested in figuring out how do we help students who are about to go do their very first interviews with people that they might be designing for? How do we help them think about how to really get into someone else's mind, but also to recognize that that has some pitfalls? So one that you just mentioned is you might assume as a designer that everybody thinks like you, that everybody's needs are kind of roughly like your own. And it might be kind of hard once you're confronted with contrary evidence that not everybody thinks just the way that you do or has the same needs um, to, to really let that register. But there's also something important to address, which is about the power dynamic between the person who's conducting the interview or making the design and perhaps the person who has the need that you're designing for. And this often comes up, like say you're interviewing or you're trying to design in a healthcare context and you're, you know, maybe you're working closely with um, doctors and clinicians to, to set the scene in an appropriate way, um, in an ethical way, but still somebody who is a patient or a family member of a patient, they are in a vulnerable position. And so you want to make sure that they never feel used or that you're just extracting their experience and then putting it to work in your designs. So this is a exercise that really helps you really experience and feel what it might be like to be on the other side of the equation, to be the person who is being interviewed. So briefly, um, we'll have students pair up, partner up, get in a big group, and everybody has to unlock their phone and pass it to the person next to them. And that person has free reign to do whatever they want with that phone for five minutes. So everybody's having this experience at the same time of both having access to someone else's private data, personal thoughts, feelings, you know, photos, et cetera, and um, also having that, you know, happening to them at the same time. So you let it run for about five minutes. What's fascinating is that you see people react in all different ways. So you see some people who are like, uh, this thing is radioactive. I don't want to touch it. Like, I feel totally uncomfortable. And actually, that might show up in their own behavior as an interviewer, right? They may be too tentative and not actually really engage with the person. You might see somebody kind of like immediately go and start posting, you know, on social on behalf of the person <laughs> that they're the, whose phone they have. And that person might actually be um, in at risk of being like overly aggressive, right? And so it, it, it's a moment to actually notice your own behavior and then think about how that's going to translate into these interview dynamics, which are, are really meant to be a moment of uh, sharing potentially of mutual development of insight. But again, they have those power dynamics and we want to make sure we're equipping our students to be treating people in a really thoughtful and ethical way above all. I've never dared to do, you know, times when you're running workshops and sometimes the facilitator will go, okay, everybody phones on the table or phones onto the table over there or into the hat here and they take them away. I've never dared to do that because phones are so personal to people and it's a brave thing to do to take somebody's phone away from them. It's uncomfortable. It is. But I think we have to really confront these issues around the dynamics in any kind of interview context. 
And while we're equipping our students with these very powerful tools around engaging with people, with stakeholders, with potentially end users of whatever they're designing, we want to make sure that they're confronting all of the real challenges and doing that in a, in a really thoughtful and caring way. Um, one of the pillars of our uh, courses is around care right? Really being thoughtful and ethical in terms of how you steward your interactions as a designer, your um, the, the, what you're creating um, and how it's affecting both the people and the, the community and even the planet um, overall. So we're, we're quite focused on helping students, even if it's uncomfortable, have these moments of insight, these aha moments. And what's really special about what happens at the D school is we don't shy away from those those difficult environments, like those difficult and sort of risky assignments or learning experiences. And we recognize that in any kind of creative work, emotions are involved, right? It is not a clinical objective practice. It requires our students to be brave and courageous and also to be thoughtful and caring, as I've said. You introduce each of those categories with your own experiences and some ideas from others and some great quotes, etc. But one of the things I really loved was that when you talked about the fact that for any learning experience to be meaningful, to actually break through some type of threshold, there needs to be an emotional connection with the content. Otherwise, you're just inhaling it long enough to get through your exams and then just exhale it, exhaling it in the exam and you'll never remember it again. That's exactly right. I mean, behavior change requires emotional engagement and that is what education it should be about, right? It's not just knowledge acquisition, it's skill acquisition, it's development of new techniques and methods and approaches. And if you want those to land and to resonate, you have to actually create those memorable experiences around learning. And also, you know, we're teaching a, a discipline and a set of methods where there's so much complexity that the students are going to have to navigate. We can't just put them in kind of a, you know, um, simulated environment and have them learn what they're really going to need to learn, right? We have to expose them to the kind of ambiguity that doing real creative work involves. And so that means like bringing those complex dynamics and emotions and moments of not being quite sure which direction to go in, like right into the heart of our teaching. And, you know, it's really, it's interesting because I think in a lot of environments, we, you know, sort of, we tend to adopt the like hyper professional, more, you know, sort of intellectual approach and try to mostly think our way through problems. And obviously, intellect and cognition is critical. But that sense of, you know, how connected you are to the problem that you're solving, how you are feeling within your team context, how you are taking a risk, potentially, th those are all very human emotional components of creative work. And we've found that we just we have to highlight that and foreground that and not shy away from it. One of the roles I take is executive coach. I do a limited amount of executive coaching. But what I find with that is I use a technique that's introduced by this brilliant book by Nancy Klein called Time to Think. And in it, she talks about creating a thinking environment for the coachee. So in there, sometimes there's going to be moments of quietude, there's going to be uncomfortable silences. But the coach cannot fill that silence. You can't come to the rescue of the coachee, so to speak. You need to let them through that moment of discomfort in order to have a breakthrough moment. And oftentimes that discomfort leads to breakthrough. And I found that similar to what you're talking about here. That's exactly right. And there are some assignments that are really devoted specifically to exploring those low moments, right? Where those, those moments of disorientation, where you're really confused, right? And that is totally normal in the context of trying to solve something that doesn't have one clear right answer, right? If you're trying to design something, you're trying to create a new service or a new product, you don't know where you're going to end up exactly. And actually, I, I always tell my students, like, if you have the idea 
going in to the project of what the solution is, it is very unlikely to be an innovation, right? It is, it is much more likely to be something that, you know, it's either out there already and you've kind of absorbed it in the zeitgeist or you're, you've, it's like a pet idea you're holding on to. That, it might be a good idea, but it's much less likely to be innovative. And so we want to help our students go through the experience of having to navigate ambiguity multiple times in the course of the, of the practice. And yet that is difficult, right? That does, it, especially, you know, students who are kind of um, extremely technically gifted, they are used to being able to kind of see the end, right? And get the good grade. And we really want them to start to build resilience in these more uncertain kinds of challenges. And so one of the examples of an assignment that really speaks to that, um, that I think you resonated with as well, is the learning journey map, right? So this is a, this is a practice where at the end of a learning experience as a reflection tool, we'll have students chart their journey through the project. So we'll have them use uh, both a axis of their emotions, how did it feel, and also how much were they learning? And what you see across those two lines is sometimes there's a gap where the students self-report that they were learning an enormous amount at a particular moment in the project, but it felt really bad, right? It was tense on their team, or it was scary, or they were unsure, or that kept them up at night. And that gap in between the, the, the how much they were learning, but how challenging it was, I think is evidence of something called productive struggle, which is a term that comes from math education, where if students are able to actually wrestle with something and actually have to take their time with it, it turns out that they learn more and retain more of that knowledge. And that kind of productive struggle is a sign of learning, right? It's like if you're activating that and you're in that zone, you are on the right track to actually becoming better at the thing that you're trying to get better at. So we need to find ways to... Um, name it and predict it and help students know that even when they're wrestling and it doesn't feel good, they are actually in that productive space and in that productive zone. It echoes really what should happen in organizations in times of rapid change or VUCA times, as we call it, volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, that we need to be vulnerable. And we need vulnerable leaders that understand that you're not going to have all the answers. And by not having all the answers doesn't mean that you're broken or you're flawed in some way. It's that things are changing at a rapid pace. And we need everyone engaged as a sensor to change and to share their ideas and to also pick holes at our ideas in order to see if they're valid. And this seems to be something that echoes the work that you're doing in the D school. Yes, I, I really resonate with that. And, you know, I think one of the things that feels makes you feel very vulnerable, particularly as a leader, is that moment when something's changing or a quick decision needs to be made and all eyes turn to you. And, you know, it feels like you it's unacceptable to say, I don't know. Right. But actually navigating through times of uncertainty requires you to be able to say, I don't know, but I know how we're going to figure it out. And that is one of those ways where if you have built a culture of learning and you have built a culture that incorporates some of these design principles, I think you create a common understanding of how do you lean into those kinds of uncertain opportunities or challenges. I mean, we've all just lived through a time where all of a sudden, all of us had to learn how to work in completely different mediums. All of us had to figure out how do we lead or manage teams remotely. And of course, you know, some companies had been doing that for a while and had some expertise to share. But for most of the, the working world, there were lots of challenges around that. So we all were thrust into this moment of rapid learning. And actually the, the kinds of skills that allowed people to lead successfully during that time were much less about, I'm certain I know the answer, and much more about, okay, let's run three quick tests and figure out how we're going to move forward, 
right? Or let's take a learning mindset. Let's take a prototyping mindset and acknowledge that we're going to have to learn as we go because none of us knows the right answer. So I think there, there actually was a moment of opening where people were communicating, you know, even in leadership ranks with kind of more humility. <laughs> and I hope that that is one of the lessons that we can take forward from this period of rapid shift that some of those strategies are actually what really endear employees to leaders, right? Is to be able to say, we're in this together. We got to figure it out together. We got to learn our way forward through this, through this mess. When I started this show, I was working for a legacy organization, a governmental organization, which often can be the most difficult to drive change in. And I was asked to come up with an idea for a show that would appeal to non-Irish people. So overseas people who were working in Ireland or overseas marketplace. And I came up with the idea of this show and it was to interview startups. It was to explore new trends and technologies, etc. So that was the original concept. And I was met with two phrases that you identify in the book. One is we tried it before and, we d and it didn't work. And the other is, oh, that would never work here. <laughs> and they were the two most common refrains I experienced. And eventually got around it and I left actually the organization shortly afterwards and the show took off considerably after that. We've tried it before and it didn't work. And that would never work around here. And they are mostly the chorus of organizational veterans within organizations. I'd love you to share the exercise that you share shadowing. That's right. So this exercise actually comes from um, leaders on our K-12 uh, team who work a lot with people in education. And in schools, there tends to be a lot of um, kind of entrenched thinking. And there's also a very interesting situation where there's a really clear distinction between the adults who are running the school and the students who are much younger. And, you know, it can be kind of a challenge, this gets back to that power dynamics conversation, uh, to really pay attention and listen and let yourself be led by needs that that really feel different than your own. And it's it's like the ultimate environment in which people, some people are experts and other people are not. And so the folks who are the experts tend to wield that, or it can happen that <laughs> the experience you had is like, oh, that new idea would never work here, or we tried it and it didn't work. And that just really constrains innovation and change over time. So this practice is called shadowing, as you said, and it involves spending a whole day really trying to walk in the shoes of someone who is going through the system that you design or that you work in and just trying to understand what their experience is. So in the case of a school, that would involve a teacher, you know, meeting a student at the bus stop where they're waiting to get on the bus, going through with them all day, having to sit in the same little desk, having to go to lunch only at the prescribed 30 minutes when they're allowed to go to lunch, you know, having to sit in classes back to back all day, having maybe, you know, very little opportunity to move around and get some, you know, sort of um, relief from, from the dominant mode in the classroom. And we see all kinds of insights come out. So some of them are, are, you know, I'm sort of foreshadowing are just about how challenging and tiring it is in the way that we've designed schools for most kids. And that can lead to like really big insights for principals and school leaders about like some, you know, redesigning the school day. In other cases, it can really give a sense for a teacher of how to reach a type of student that they have been having trouble identifying with because they didn't realize all the things that were happening in this kid's life before they got to school, right? Or they didn't realize the dynamics that they were experiencing. And so like one teacher, for example, did this assignment and noticed that the, the middle school students she was shadowing, they just didn't interact with adults at all unless they were being directly called on. And she realized there's just this big gap in sort of relational trust within this school. 
And we have devised a culture that is that is kind of maintaining that difference. And we nobody intended that, but that's what's here. And so we have to actually figure out how to build some better bridges and engage the whole student, not just the sort of the, the body in the seat in the classroom. So it can be a way of getting out of your own way of thinking or seeing or observing and really stepping into someone else's shoes. And I'll say that um, that is a that is a practice you have to commit to, right? There is there is really a need to be open minded when you're leaning into that. Um, but I've seen it happen in many many contexts where someone is very surprised and disarmed by how different the reality is for the person that they thought that they were serving pretty well and and be quite moved by that experience. And so back to the theme of how important feelings are, nothing can help change a leader's mind about what's possible or what's needed of having an emotional connection and really observing or witnessing someone who is struggling or, or, you know, just having a very different experience than you expect in, in something that they thought they understood pretty well. Linking together a few of the things we've talked about was like, for example, lessons learned from the pandemic and equity. So I was thinking about a way to silence the hippo, the highest paid person in the room, or the highest paid person's opinion. And also those people who are just loud, those people who always have an opinion, who always talk, etc. Because one thing we saw during the pandemic was that people who had been previously quiet in a physical world became outspoken or at least more outspoken in a virtual world. So probably because they were comfortable at home on Zoom, it would, they were in their own environment. And it showed the importance of neurodiversity and being able to cater for different people's workspaces and work preferences. But you've devised and you, you talk about an exercise that really, really works well, to make sure that there's equity of voice, or equal share of voice in a room. And this is an exercise called talkers and listeners. So this one um, was developed by uh, Leticia Britos Cavanaro um, and Melissa Pellicino, who um, just uh, they really just had this amazing insight about how to build a different kind of rapport amongst the the participants in their workshops and and in their classes and you know every single one of us has been in a room where like a few people are taking up all the airtime and really dominating and it is so frustrating when that happens because you can look around and say like oh there's 25 other people in this room who have ideas to contribute but there's just not enough time and this assignment is really aimed at figuring out how do you shift that culture without blaming or shaming anyone, but actually just bringing some more insight and empathy to why different people show up differently in a particular kind of uh, workshop environment or, or corporate environment. So the way that this works is that you um, ask people to self-identify as either talkers or listeners. And there's no sitting on the fence. You have to be one or the other just for the purposes of this exercise. And of course, like that, that behavior of being, you know, really vocal or not is situational, right? So nobody is just one or the other for their whole life. But in for this assignment, you have people split split into those two groups. You have the talkers talk amongst themselves and the listeners talk amongst themselves. And the idea is for them to come up with some insights about why they are talkers or why they are listeners in this particular context, and also to come up with some questions for the other, uh, the quote, other side. Then you line everybody up, or if you're on Zoom, you're, you know, sort of in a, in a online environment, and you just have the groups pose those questions to each other and hear each other out. And what's, um, Leticia used a really beautiful metaphor in describing what happens, which is like, you can see people's assumptions about why other people behave in certain ways in groups just go like poof in the air above their heads, right? It's like very disarming. So you might hear somebody who's a real, you know, vocal talker and, you know, airtime stealer, in your opinion, you might hear them say, oh, well, I always just jump in because like, I want to make sure everybody feels comfortable talking. And you're like, oh, well, they, in their mind, they're providing a service to the group. Right. And you might hear someone else say, Oh, I don't mind that I'm quiet. 
that's not a, I'm not upset about that. I'm just a kind of a slow processor and I want to take it in. And when I, I speak when I'm comfortable, but I don't need, you know, sort of a, or you might hear some other dynamics around, you know, your, your particular group culture that help you forge a better understanding of where everybody's at. And of course, the goal is really just to equip people to have insight into how each operates. And that is such a fundamental ingredient to creating psychological safety and trust within groups. And so just airing out that layer of communication difference is is really, really effective. I love your warm up exercise. And this is one of your own. So this is um, particularly there's a guest we had on the show and he has a, a, a great book called Be Less Zombie. So he talks about being less zombie in an organization and just go with the, you know, doing what the organization always did, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I have to share with them this exercise, the zombie apocalypse quartets. Well, I love that uh, approach of being less zombie. I really resonate with that. Um, uh, I think you always have to be um, thinking about, you know, sort of going against the grain when when it's the right thing to do. But so in this case, um, I'm really fascinated with how groups form and how they start to break down the sort of uh, typical ways of interacting to get into more creative behaviors. And so I developed this particular sequence of warm up activities to like help groups really start to get comfortable working with each other. And so the zombie part is preceded by a slightly easier point of entry where I'll have everybody in the room find a partner. They will pair up and and just tell each other the story of their name. And that builds just like a little bit of bonding between those two people. Then those two people have to find another pair. And that forms the quartet that then goes through the uh, zombie apocalypse together, so to speak. So the, the provocation for the quartet is, you know, let's say we're having the zombie apocalypse. It's just started today. What are the skills that each of you bring to our mutual survival through this through this next difficult moment? And what's neat about that prompt is that it gets people to actually go beyond the professional. So a lot of times in groups, you'll see people say like, oh, I'm the executive vice president of such and such. And like that doesn't actually tell you much about what it's going to be like to collaborate with this person or how they operate in the world. But if you find out that they are a woodworker or that they know how to grow vegetables or that they are really good at uh, conflict mediation, and those are the skills they're going to bring to the zombie apocalypse, all of a sudden you have like an actual human connection. And what's, you know, obviously like this is a very lighthearted frame and that's part of, you know, my commitment to always bring fun and levity into the hard work of collaboration and innovation. So it's a, it's a funny premise, but actually it, it kind of gets people to unlock that little bit of human connection that is so important for building those, those creative bonds of trust. It's so important that, isn't it? The, the fun aspect, um, you, you talk about psychological safety, but but creating the right environment for people to feel it's okay to unmask and to be themselves and to to show warts and all it, it's like, I think it's so often underestimated how important that is, even in particularly when you're working with consultants as well, when oftentimes it's, it's seen as a serious, a real serious thing. And it is but it can't be too serious where people freeze. That's right. And I mean, there is a real need if you're going to be doing any kind of creative work. It's like you're going to have to tap into something playful to expand how your brain is looking at the problem. But if you feel constrained, if you feel frozen by, you know, whatever is the seriousness of the project or the corporate culture, you're just much less likely to access that kind of playfulness. And there's really interesting research um, by a faculty member at Stanford named uh, Justin Berg uh, about how hard it is to take a very conventional idea and make it more interesting. You can always take a totally wild idea and kind of like bring it back to reality and make it something that you could implement, but it's quite hard to go in the other direction. And so creating the context where you're actually feeling free enough and safe enough to play, right, to imagine something totally ludicrous, 
that is actually the posture that you need to get to, to get into the more free flowing aspects of, you know, the ideation part of, of innovative work. And to do that, you have to invest in the relationships. And, you know, I, I think a, a lot of people are really, um, you know, used to doing kind of icebreakers at the beginning of like a meeting or a workshop or something like that. I really think about um, how to take that a little bit further and how to how to design the warm up activity to elicit the actual behavior that I want to support in whatever exercise we're about to do in whatever project we're about to lead. And so thinking about it, not just as a way to kind of like break the ice, but actually to give people that little piece of practice of the kind of behavior they're about to have to step into, that tends to be, I think, a much more powerful use of that time and use of that kind of uh, icebreaker approach. I thought that was so interesting about it's easier to almost dial it back than it is to dial it forward. And uh, it reminded me, even playing sport, one of my coaches used to do when when you're doing like fitness training he'd mark out 100 meters but he'd make it 110 so when <laughs> when it came to comp competition you had trained for the longer period i was like it's kind of like that except in a in a psychological sense and actually train your brain to to go further and to be able to diverge in order to converge later on i love that because also isn't there that effect when when you get close to the end you start to you almost start to slow down it's like going for the 110 means you're gonna like blow through that 100 you know 100 meter mark didn't, it didn't work for me yeah, sarah probably, <laughs> i still lost so <laughs> not, not a prize winning i was fitter though uh, you have other talents <laughs> You know, that makes me think also of another um, another assignment in the book, um, which is about helping you get over the psychological hurdle that happens when you have a deadline. So often people kind of like hurry up and finish a piece of work at the deadline, um, especially if you're like me, I'm very deadline driven. So there's like always a big rush to the to the finish line. Um, then you get feedback and, and critique. And or you, you know, get the you do the presentation, your boss says, like, go, no, go, whatever, whatever the sort of milestone is. But if you had one more week after that critique, you know how you would make that idea better. And so Carissa Carter, who's our academic director, d uses that actual, you know, sort of reality about human psychology in her class, where if there is a, a first deadline for the project, you get real feedback from, you know, like real kind of judges and people who are going to give you real criticism, then you have one more week to actually finish. And that really helps students take their work from kind of what they think they can achieve to what they actually can achieve. But it's a, it's just really playing with that piece of human psychology about how we re respond to deadlines and giving people that chance to go that extra 10 meters. Um, and it's a quite effective tool. I love it. I love it. And thanks for we weaving it in there as well. Got an, ex got an extra one in there, Sarah, as well. Um, one of the one of the things that is so essential, again, and this goes beyond beyond design thinking or beyond seeking out feedback for your for your product or your service, but even into the workplace to seeking out feedback on how did I do. And it connects almost to your learning map as well. But if I was to ask others, how did I do? I thought this was so important about frames. And in, in there, it's also my body language, my body language in in the requester of the feedback. And then also uh, observing the body language of the person giving the feedback as well, are their arms folded, etc. There, there's a lot in this, but I thought this is so essential to all aspects of change, innovation, product design, whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, I think we still suffer in many cases from the sort of myth of the lone genius who just like comes up with a new idea and then all of a sudden it like hits the market. And of course, you know, anybody involved in innovative work knows that that is that is not true. And part of the, you know, essential aspects of, of this type of work is getting feedback and then making stuff better as a result of the feedback that you get. But that is hard to do, right? Like we are sensitive creatures as humans, and particularly when you've poured your heart and soul into creating something new, it can be very hard to um, take in 
critical feedback if things aren't as good as you think that they are. So we have a whole range of ways of equipping people to get better at that practice of seeking and receiving feedback and also giving feedback, which is like a whole important set of skills in and of itself. So this particular assignment um, is called Frame and Concept, and it helps you sort through and distinguish of all the feedback that you're getting, what is really about the quality of your insight or the way that you're framing the whole project or the whole opportunity. And what is just about, well, I like the actual, the other, you know, the underlying insight really resonates. And I think there's a need there, but the particular solution you've come up with, the concept that you're proposing right now, that's where I have the problem. And people who are giving you feedback aren't necessarily going to express themselves that clearly. And so it's your job as the designer to really be able to sort through the feedback and, and hear, oh, this is actually you know, about the, the frame itself that I'm using. And this over here is just, you know, sort of like, um, almost like line item feedback about the concept. And if you're getting feedback that indicates that your frame is faulty, then you really need to go back into the research phase. You need to revisit your assumptions. If you're getting feedback about just the concept itself, then you might actually have really hit a real need and an opportunity, but you need to, you need to tweak up, you know, like really shore up how you're solving the problem. So it's very helpful because it helps you then orient. If I'm going to go through an iteration cycle, what am I actually needing to change? One of the things that you reiterate throughout is the importance of doing that early, because I often think about this even in if you're a corporate innovator or a corporate explorer, a, a change maker within an organization, it's so hard to get something through that sometimes yourself, you you fall in love with your own idea and you you don't want to put it out there because you, and then and then you'll say, 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 I bring it to you, Sarah, and, and you have some type of sign off and you destroy my idea, you, you, you say what what I should do and what it's not doing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I walk away and I kind of go, oh, that's just because she doesn't want it. She's a dinosaur. She doesn't want the organization to change. But you h highlight the importance of my humility to be able to go, even though there might be a little bit of that, yes, there's always some type of knowledge in the feedback, even if it hurts. Yeah. And your, I mean, your description of like falling in love with your idea is so resonant. <laughs> like that's what we just do naturally as humans. So you were talking about body language before. And, you know, one thing that we'll do in a class is we'll have everybody put their work up on a wall or on a table. And then everybody comes around to the same side and views it together. Right. And that's a way of saying what we're doing now is we're critiquing the work. We're not critiquing the person who made it. And that like pulling that apart and not taking everything as like a personal, either a personal attack on you or an indictment of the person who didn't like the work in the first place, but really thinking about what is this work intended to do? Am I presenting it in a way that other people can experience it and actually, you know, really see that for themselves? And if it's not landing, then I have to change something about the, the either the way I'm testing it or the thing itself. And having that skill to to take it out of the like, this is a personal critique into this is a critique of the work is hard. Not everybody is skilled at giving good critique, but it is possible as you start to understand the these kinds of mechanics and use these kinds of strategies. It's a tough thing, isn't it? I, I was thinking about that, that the bias, the mum effect or shooting the messenger that in an organization that happens all the time where I know something's wrong with the organization, but I know also if I'm the person who pipes up and says it, there's a risk that comes with that. And I mean, as you said, it's so human, even when you're correcting essays or correcting an assignment for somebody to an astute to a student, the student might have thought you were great until you corrected their, <laughs> their assignment. And now all of a sudden, there's a little bit of like, you're a jackass, McCullen. I, I, I thought you were okay, but now you're not. And th there's like it's so difficult i i was thinking about even though even if you're self-aware and you're mature about it and you know it's for your better your your good your improvement there's still this this little underlying the amygdala remembers 
I, I think that's very well put. And I think what we try to do is to help people have an experience where they see how positive it is to get that kind of critique and then plow that back into the into the work itself. And that helps you remember when you're going through one of those hard moments where someone gives you some, you know, uh, difficult feedback or criticism that it is going to help you actually improve and it is going to help you learn. But that, you know, it's like you need to that that is a learned response, not something that comes naturally to us. It's so true, isn't it? Even with even with children, I, I keep saying to my kids, I, I go, look, if I didn't care, I wouldn't say anything. The fact that I'm actually saying something, it kind of gives me a bit of a license, by the way, to say stuff. But it, I'm like, kind of going, I, I wouldn't care. And if a coach doesn't say anything, they don't really care. So when somebody actually takes time to give you feedback, it's an investment on their behalf, because it's risky giving feedback as well. So I, I'm on the same page as you. I thought, I thought one we'd finish with and it's more it's more than an exercise and please throw in any exercises you feel work well for this but one of the sections I loved was the the feeling of learning you 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 put a, a lot of time into that aspect of the the feelings of learning you call this section of the book and we've talked about little bits of it so far but I'd love your your thoughts on that from a D school perspective from being a facilitator, or even at a higher level from an organizational perspective, to create that type of environment where the feeling is right, uh, the mindset's right, um, even if it's the temperature of the room or food, whatever it might be, any tips that you have for our audience? Well, I think one way to really think about it is to imagine that you are designing the learning experience from beginning to end. And you can map that out. You can make a storyboard. You can think about there's going to be some ebbs and flows of energy. How are you going to manage that? You can think about what are the moments where you want people to align and converge? And what are the moments when you want people to kind of go off in lots of different directions and have different ideas? Now, you're going to have to recognize that like then bringing people back together is its own thing. And it has a different type of energy and, and types of strategies you need to employ. But really thinking holistically about that underlying piece of how are people likely to experience each of the different sections of the what you're creating. I mean, in the same way that somebody might storyboard a movie and think about the highs and lows and the moments of tension and excitement and the moments of maybe there's a reveal and maybe there's a moment of quiet reflection, thinking about how folks who are introverted or extroverted might experience those different moments differently and you need to be designing for those thinking about all the stuff we've talked about around power dynamics and who speaks the most and how to actually empower people to get their ideas out there. That is the job of a facilitator or a teacher is to create that broader environment and to think from the very beginning, I mean, even before the beginning, what's the invitation to the event going to look like and feel like, right? And what's the piece of follow-up? And you know, then I'll just say, and this is, you know, from so many years of um, making this mistake over and over, like take one thing out, right? The more, the more richness that you're trying to build into something, the more likely it is you're going to like run out of time because as people go through the experience, they're going to be bringing their own, you know, ahas to it. So I am guilty of this almost every time I design something is like I over-program it. I'm still learning that lesson. That's my particular pitfall. Um, and we all have them as, as designers of these, these experiences. But it's just, you know, what I really want people to hear is that managing the, the real human experience of being together in collaboration, trying to tackle something challenging and open-ended, that just requires attention to the, the emotional experience of it. And the more you can hone in on that layer as you're designing everything else, the more you can create a really powerful experience for the people in the room. Beautiful. And Sarah, I have one question for you, which is more homework. So, so many people think, for example, uh, you talk about like stealing. So, so the concept of 
it, the solution already exists out there. There, there is some solution oftentimes, and this goes for corporate innovators as well. Sometimes it's in a different field or a different area or different, as Rita McGrath would say, a different arena. And you just need to look biomimicry, for example, is stealing from nature, if you want to call it that. But it's changing the relationship with the word steal and how that actually feels to us to go, well, take the prototype from something before, or maybe it's something that didn't work in a different field, but could work in your field. This is a really important aspect. And I think maybe you, you might have some exercise that people can do with this in order to enhance their creativity and perhaps their curiosity. Yeah, I mean, there is a wonderful assignment um, that Matt Roth developed that's in the book that is um, called The Solution Already Exists. And it is, a, you know, it is a provocation to go figure out like who else has done something similar to what you're trying to do in a totally different field and then kind of reverse engineer what that's what how that's actually working. And, you know, you're right. We, we often somehow think that a good idea is one that we completely think up in a vacuum. And that's what makes, you know, sort of a creative person. And the reality is it's so much more about synthesis and about borrowing and about thinking in lateral ways and about, you know, taking yourself on a walk and seeing something in nature and realizing that could port back to your the, the challenge that you're trying to solve. Um, one more assignment that I really recommend if you're trying to um, kind of free your mind and like loosen the constraints that you have unconsciously imposed on how you're thinking about something is to do what's called a derive. And this is a walk that you take that instead of just having a plan for, you know, walking around your block or walking through your neighborhood, you follow a particular quality. So you might choose to follow the color yellow. So you go up to something that's yellow, then you go up to the next thing that's yellow, and that's how you navigate through your walk. Or you might follow smells or really anything that you can think of. Um, but I had someone follow um, curves one time. And she said she wound up uh, spending a lot of time looking at all of the curves in this very intricate root system in a tree. And then she went on to say, I'm a systems engineer. She was working at a big apparel company. And she was realizing she had this profound insight about how a lot of her work was invisible to many of her colleagues on the retail side. But the systems that she was engineering, like the roots of this complex tree, were in, like intimately integrated with then having a really effective product launch. And so it gave her a new vocabulary to be able to engage some of her colleagues who like really were struggling to understand how to connect their work with her work. So you never know what you might come up with when you kind of like really start to think in one of these unconventional kinds of ways, but it can it can come right back to being very effective in helping you achieve whatever it is you're trying to get done. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And the book is, is stunning. I'm holding up here to the camera. Uh, there's like, comic style in there there's like uh all the exercises it's all in color as well and the good news is well i have a copy up for grabs just sign up to the innovation show dot io newsletter and you can be in the hat to win a copy of that beautiful book sarah for people who want to reach out to you or find out more about your work or the d school where can they find you well uh you can go check out dschool.stanford.edu that's a great place to start um, you can also find the book on Amazon, any big bookseller. We actually have a whole series of books that we've been busy publishing at the D School. Um, so if you look at dschoolbooks.com, that's the way to um, actually get some uh, um, discounts for, for looking at the whole bundle of books. But we've been publishing these guides to lots of different facets of design and how to use design in really uh, kind of an everyday context. So there's a book about um, acts of courage, right, which is all about how to, um, you know, think about courage, not just as something that's on an epic scale, but something you might do every day when you volunteer an idea in the workplace, right? There's a book about how do you use design to create more belonging in your community, um, there's a whole book about how you can visualize data through making maps to express your ideas in new ways. So there's lots of really juicy topics in, in those books, and I recommend them all. 
and I absolutely recommend the book and all the books as well. And they're they're beautifully designed as you would expect from the creative people in the D School. Sarah, it's an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Executive Director of the Stanford D School, author of this beautiful book, Creative Acts for Curious People, How to Think, Create and Lead in Unconventional Ways. Sarah Stein Greenberg, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Aidan. It's been a great conversation. Thank you once again to our sponsor, Gate One, with offices in Dublin, New York, and London. Gate One work with organizations all over the world to drive meaningful business transformation and change. You can find Gate One at gateoneconsulting.com.